<laughs> okay, the recording has started. So I'll uh, start by briefly introducing the speaker. So uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first talk of the Astro Week 2021. Uh, we are very honored to have Professor Tarun Swaradeep with us today as the speaker. Sir needs no introduction to ISA students, but I will try to introduce him briefly. Uh, Professor Swaradeep is an internationally renowned cosmologist who has made significant contributions to cosmology and gravitational wave astronomy. His, pri uh, his primary research interests include testing the fundamental assumptions in the standard model of cosmology and understanding subtle violations of the statistical isotropy of the observed CMB sky. Professor Swaradeep has leading roles in many mega science initiatives. He serves as a, as a spokesperson for the LIGO India project and as the principal investigator for the CMB Bharat Consortium. Sir obtained his PhD at Ayuka Pune and subsequently held postdoctoral positions at the Canadian, Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics and the Kansas State University. He then built and led a stunning cosmology subgroup on uh, cosmological background, uh, microwave background studies at Ayuka. Sir joined ISA Pune in 2019 as professor and chair of the physics department. We are very fortunate to have him. Professor Swaradeep's contributions to science have received national as well as international recognition. He is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences India. He is the youngest Indian scientist to have been elected fellow of the International Society of General Relativity and Gravitation in 2030. Sir is a co-recipient of the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics 2016 and the Gruber Cosmology Prize 2018, among many, many other awards. So if we discuss Sir's awards here, we'll be sitting here throughout the evening. So with this, with this short introduction, I would like to hand over the mic to Professor Swaradeep for his talk. Thank you. Um, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, so let me begin by you know thanking you all for being present at this uh, evening hour uh, for Astro Week 2021. It's exciting to see so much interest in astronomy amongst the young students of ISA and also elsewhere. And I would like to tell you uh, you know amazing success story uh, that has played itself out. Uh, you know, just during my own research career. And this has to do with the cosmic microwave background, uh, its uh, fluctuations, and the remarkable transformation it has, uh, you know, caused in the cosmology that we do, in our understanding of the universe, you know. And so that's why I titled it uh, as the universe being unraveled in its own cosmic globe. Uh, so what you see here in the opening slide is, of course, uh, the, st the stunning picture from Hanley, uh, taken by Dolce Anchuk, who is an astronomer there, of the Milky Way, which is essentially our home in the cosmological sense. It's a very ordinary galaxy in amongst billions of galaxies here. But if you peer past this galaxy, uh, galactic emissions uh, far, far away, you would see a globe uh, that is of cosmological origin, uh, which is called the cosmic microwave background. And the story revolves around that. So let me begin by reminding you uh, that we live in an expanding universe. And uh, that is one of the amazing results of applying Einstein's general relativity, which is, we believe is the theory of gravitation, direct theory of gravitation, to a uniform distribution of matter on cosmic scales. And uh, this is something that Einstein did uh, as a problem with his new theory, uh, as a problem to solve with his new theory. And it's one of the simplest problems to imagine in general relativity, which is a very complex set of 10 uh, in the nonlinear differential equations. But uh, in this case, this when the simplest problem revealed the amazing surprise that uh, typically in a universe that is uh, smooth, uh, with smoothly distributed matter, simple, simplest thing that you could think, 
leads to a conclusion that space would be expanding in time in such a universe. It would be both either expanding or contracting, but uh, observationally, uh, Hubble's uh, you know observations in 1920s, uh, 1927 to be more precise, sort of uh, showed that galaxies around us seem to be receding from us, and further a galaxy, the further faster it seemed to be receding. And this fits very well with the idea of a expanding universe, a universe where the three-dimensional space uh, is changing in size as it evolves in time. So from one snapshot of the universe to another, the space between uh, regularly spaced particles are shown here in this picture keeps increasing. So if I was sitting on one of these particles, I would see all other particles around me receding from me. And further the particle is, the faster it would appear to recede. And that's the simplest explanation for the Hubble's uh, uh, observation of uh, you know, galaxies from which light appeared to be redshifted. And the left shift was more and more as you looked at distant galaxies, more distant galaxies. So there are many consequences of the expanding universe. In fact, all of cosmology, as I keep emphasizing in my courses to students, is basic physics applied in this dynamic arena, okay, in this expanding universe. But the physics is the same that you learn in any branch of physics, any you know undergraduate or graduate physics. Cosmologists are actually physicists who happen to be working in this expanding arena uh, of space. Okay. One of the consequences of an expanding universe is the following, and I talk about what is most relevant for my discussions is that if I have a universe full of galaxies. As we know, our universe is. Um, get this back. Uh, you would see that the number of galaxies in an imaginary box, if I draw a box around us, the number of galaxies at this time, you know, would have been denser when the universe was half its size, half in all the dimensions, because the universe is expanding in time, going back in time, the universe is smaller. So the number density would be eight. Similarly, if you go to the time when it was one fourth the density, the number density would be 64. Okay, and uh, that is pretty understandable. What is interesting is if I were to worry about relativistic matters like light, a uh, cosmic bath of radiation, then the radiation contained in this box of course, the number of photons will scale exactly like the way number of galaxies scale. But remember, in a smaller box, the photons have to fit uh, with a smaller wavelength. And that means their frequency is twice as large. So instead of, uh, you know, number density goes up by 8, but the energy density goes up by a factor of 16. And here, number density goes up to 64, and this should have read 256. Okay, it's 128 is wrong here. Okay. So what does it tell us? It tells us that even at this time, if you convert, uh, you know, the mass of all galaxies into energy by MC square rule, and then compare it to the cosmic radiation, actually, it's a factor of 10,000 smaller. So radiation is 10,000 times weaker in the or less con contributing 10,000 times less than the matter density in the universe now. But however, this uh, simple difference in what happens in expanding universe tells you that that going back in time, the energy density of radiation grows faster than the radiation uh, energy density of matter. And in fact, when the universe was 10,000 times smaller, the energy density in radiation was comparable to the energy density in matter. And for all times prior to that, 
the energy density of radiation uh, actually dominates the energy density of matter. So if I am worried about how the universe originated, what's the uh, you know early universe like? The early universe, uh, because of this expanding uh, space, um, is radiation dominated. Even if radiation is insignificant now. Okay, but that is interesting. But the question is, where is all the radiation in the universe? And that's the question we answered in 1965. In fact, serendipitously, although 10 kilometers away from Bell Labs, where they discovered the cosmic background radiation, uh, there was a group in Princeton uh, led by Bob Dickey, which who which was building some similar telescope to actually hunt for this. Uh, radiation. And uh, this serendipitous discovery meant that we had discovered the dominant radiation content of the universe. And we had also seen, which was the biggest puzzle thing that puzzled uh, Penzias and Wilson, is that this radiation seemed to be coming equally from all directions at all times. So it's an isotropic bath. And also, if our understanding of uh, where it came from, which is the early dense phase of the universe, it's just a glow from the early dense phase of the universe, then you expect it to follow a black body spectrum, a Planck spectrum. And all these points are extremely well, uh, you know, observationally verified. Okay, so we know that it's isotropic to 10 parts per million. It's a black body to the extent that we have measured it, which is again some Thing like 10 parts per million and the temperature now is known to uh, the third decimal point okay and this was one of the biggest discoveries because uh, the fact that it's a black body uh, that confirmation came in 1990 not 65 from Kobe and that is a clinching support for this idea that the universe originated in a hot and dense phase okay so the current present universe we see evolved from a hot and dense space. So if we look out into the universe, you know, as I look out, as I see distant things, I see them as they were in the past. So when we see the sun, we see it as it was eight minutes ago compared to now, right? And uh, if I see a distant galaxy, typically it could be hundreds of millions or even billion years back in time. You know, but if you carry this story forward and look at light from as distant a source as you want, then observation we know you can go 43 billion light years till we hit a universe which is hot and so hot and dense, it's about a thousand times hotter than what the universe is now. Uh, so it's of three Kelvin, the uh, microwave background there is at 3000 Kelvin and at that temperature it ionizes the hydrogen and helium and creates essentially in back in time a wall of plasma. So when we look back uh, we go and hit this early universe at an age of half a million years old compared to our current age of 14 billion years and we cannot really look further out into the universe because this is essentially a dense fog. It's ionized plasma. And so this is an amazing, uh, what I would call super IMAX theater. It's a plasma screen super IMAX theater, which nature has provided us, where what is playing out is the universe as it was a long, long time ago. So half a million years old universe is like looking at a one, baby, you know, a one day old baby uh, you know, and comparing uh, that to, uh, you know, a hundred year old man. So that is uh, the kind of contrast uh, of how far back we are looking in time. We are also looking back as far as it's possible uh, to do with electromagnetic radiation. In fact, with any form of communication, you can go only 3% more beyond this 43 billion light years. Okay. So for uh, those amongst you who are familiar with space-time diagram, 
this is a nice way to understand it. So as I told you, the universe is a spatial hypersurface. So here I've drawn it as a two dimensional hypersurface, which is evolving in time. So, you know, it's looking at snapshots of the universe in time. And this is time is something called conformal time, but let's not worry about it. It's a uh, valid measure of uh, how time elapses in the universe. But in these time and space coordinates, uh, light travels along 45 degree light cones, just like you're familiar with from special relativity. So if I am here and now and I look back, I have to look back along this cone. I cannot uh, look back, uh, you know, uh, I can't see the universe uh, as it is now, right? A distant galaxy will be somewhere along this light cone. And hence back in time somewhere. So when I see some object here, it is actually at a time so much behind us. Okay. So I go further out. I go to a universe which is uh, 1100 times smaller. Hence, the temperature of the microwave background there is 3300 Kelvin. And as I told you, that's hot enough to keep all the hydrogen and helium in the universe ionized. So you basically hit something where beyond which the universe is ionized. So even if I have electromagnetic phenomena happening here, there is no coherent information coming to us because it gets scattered so much that there's no information. Just like you know, in the fog, uh, you cannot see a distant car, not so much because the headlights and photons are not coming to you. They are coming, but they are scattered so much and diffused away so much that you don't see them, uh, you know, they sort of add to a overall glow of the plasma. Okay, and this plasma is glowing at 3300 Kelvin. But when by the time this glow comes to us, the expanding universe has reduced the temperature by a factor of 1000 to about three Kelvin. So this is the story. Uh, this is the arena in which we are, our story of the cosmos uh, is played out. So again, let me emphasize the reason this uh, cosmic micro background is uh, one of the observations that unraveled the universe is because this is, these are observations on the largest scales possible in the universe. And going back to the furthest back in time that you could go back with electromagnetism. Okay. So what do we want to see there? So for about 25 years from 65 to 1992, we essentially saw a blank screen. We saw a glowing screen at three, temp three Kelvin temperature. We didn't see any structure in it. But we believed that there would be structure because if you look at the distribution of galaxies in the universe, this is a map of galaxies in our uh, universe. Uh, you can see the stick is pretty small. One billion light years is this much. So it's a huge volume of the universe around us. And you can see the galaxies are distributed in a very cellular structure. This organized structure that we see in mass, uh, since uh, matter and radiation were tightly coupled in the early universe, must have left some imprint in the microwave background. And for 25 years, people were searching this uh, IMAX theater. So they were making it, making more and more sensitive measurements to see if there are tiny variations in the temperature of the microwave background as you look across the sky. And this was absolutely a consequence of the large scale structure in the distribution of galaxies that we see. And uh, it is amazing that, you know, doing this exercise with basic physics, we have uncovered a universe that is simple. It's expanding in a computable way, which is amazing. And it's amazing that we can compute things and measure them and understand cosmology. So this is a quote from Jim Peebles, who won the uh, Nobel Prize uh, in 2019. And uh, this is an amazing fact that, you know, sitting on a tiny speck of dust in the universe, we are able to say so much about the uh, history and, you know, uh, uh, evolution of the universe. Uh, just uh, by using human intellect coupled with uh, technical capabilities. 
So what uh, the Cosmic Background Explorer discovered in 1992, and that was around the time that I had just started my PhD. And so this was one of the first things that I, only things that I worked on was that it saw that the temperature of the micro background uh, varied slightly over the sky at the level of tens of micro Kelvin in that three Kelvin bath. So one part in a million, uh, 10 parts in a million, okay? And then suddenly the IMAX theater, which was just a glowing screen, you know, came to life because we could see the universe play out as, uh, you know, it's uh, play out as it was when it was half a million years old. And what is happening there is these fluctuations are exactly the same fluctuations that gave rise to the last scale structure that we see in the universe, this whole distribution in the uh, in uh, in an organization in the distribution of galaxies, the last case structure in the galaxies, and also this relates to very early universe and very high energy physics, because something must have given rise to these perturbations, and we believe that there is a phase in the early universe which is related to probably grand unified theory scale or some scale of that kind where physics at ultra ultra high energies uh, played out and the physics uh, created density fluctuations uh, that are being seen in the microwave background. So these are the seed perturbations. As I tell, told you that uh, in cosmology, although it's a very enigmatic subject, the enigma is in the conclusions. The physics that we use is absolutely the same that you use uh, in day-to-day -day life. And for example, many of you must have done uh, the resonance tube experiment. Something very similar happens uh, in what we, uh, how we understand the fluctuations on the plasma screen. So if you have a plasma, it behaves like an elastic medium and it oscillates if you perturb it, okay, just like a drum. And we actually, when we see the perturbation, the fluctuation in the micro background, we are actually hearing the music of this cosmic drum. Just like if you play a resonance tube, you know, uh, with the tuning fork, you hear the sound of the tuning fork uh, being amplified with the, uh, you know, resonant frequencies. So what is the resonant frequency here? Here the point is the universe started off in a plasma and then when the universe expanded to about uh, the time it was 1100 times smaller than now, okay? Then the plasma stopped being ionized and turned neutral, okay? So it no longer was an elastic medium in which waves could propagate. So what happens is if I perturb such a medium, the waves run up to a particular distance and then stagnate. And we are seeing essentially the superposition of many, many such uh, rings around spikes. And I use an analogy that many of you may have heard before. The analogy is to imagine sitting by a placid lake and where there's a burst of shower. Now around every raindrop that falls on the lake surface, a ripple will start and travel out. Uh, and if I wait uh, half a minute or something, 30 seconds, actually the water will turn all kind of choppy. It will, you don't think there is any information. It's all random fluctuations. But if you're smart, you would infer that around every raindrop, there was a wave which went out. And in 30 seconds, would have only gone a particular distance. So similarly, in the universe, by the time the universe transited from being ionized to uh, neutral, the wave actually travels a computable distance of 150 megaparsecs. So if I really analyze in Fourier space these fluctuations in the microwave background, I should be able to uncover this hidden scale of 150 megaparsecs. And 
that reflects itself in what we call the power spectrum. So in the from the CMP sky map, we compute something called the power spectrum. And these are predicted power spectra in this expanding universe for various uh, values of the ordinary matter density, the total matter density, the expansion rate, etc. And it looks like a wiggle. But you know, it's a very distinct feature. So even if you were not worried about the physics, you know that the day you measure this well, you would know the parameters of cosmology well. But nevertheless, these bumps and wiggles are not random. They're essentially superpositions of beautiful resonant uh, uh, peaks in the density of the plasma. And since the plasma is moving relativistically, there's also a Doppler shift of the light. And hence, there is something which is out of phase and fills in this gap. So if you add these two, you get these bumps and wiggles. But this scale at which this first peak is there and the height of the peak actually tells you uh, is the scale. These are all related to this ripple, which uh, is of 150 megaparsec size uh, now. So we understand the basic physics extremely well. Now the question is, how well have we able to uncover the uh, measurements possible on this IMAX theater? So as I said, 1990s, uh, Hobi opened the uh, door to this new possibility where it first measured fluctuations, but it measured them with a very coarse vision. So it did not resolve all the fluctuations. The signal to noise was also poor. Then uh, essentially uh, the next decade, there was Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, which was launched uh, from NASA by NASA, which measured the same fluctuations, but at a much better resolution and signal to noise. And then the last decade had been dominated by observations from Planck. And the last observation results were uh, given out in 2018. And the observations are taken between 2009 and 2011. And that gives you the best maps that we have of the fluctuations in the temperature of the micro background on the sky. OK? And you can see that from this epoch, when I started my PhD, to now, uh, the observations are a thousand times more sensitive and a hundred times better in resolution. Okay. And while we talk mostly about these three space missions, there have been lots of experiments from the ground and balloons, which also made spectacular discoveries uh, with the microwave background. So here is our most detailed picture of the fluctuations on this IMAX theater. OK, so these are temperature fluctuations where the reddest part, dark red, is 300 Kelvin above the mean. And this is 300 Kelvin below the mean. The mean, of course, is at 3 Kelvin, which is subtracted out. So we are looking only at the variations. And this is one of the most amazing things. Again, sitting on Earth, we are seeing uh, how a plasma surface in the universe when it was half a million years old, looked at very, very high, high resolution. In fact, uh, at high resolutions, uh, these basic physics uh, that we are talking about is no longer relevant. And you know, so this has extracted all the science that you can do for the kind of cosmology we are doing now. So again, if I convert it into a power spectrum, this is one of the best uh, measurements uh, this is the best measurement of the power spectrum. And also one of the you know very jaw-droppingly accurate measurements in cosmology. You see that the error bars are hardly visible uh, to the best fit uh, cosmological model. And you can see this resonant phenomena. And you can resolve out eight of its peaks. And as I told you, the first peak uh, uh, location is exactly at 220, which tells us that the universe is uh, spatially flat. OK? Space time is not flat. It's the spatial surface, which is a three-dimensional surface, which is flat. But that's a remarkable thing to know sitting on Earth. And 
that the amount of baryons uh, in the universe, ordinary matter in the universe, is exactly as you would have predicted from Big Bang nucleosynthesis in the early universe. Okay, it's about five percent of the matter density uh, of the uh, density in the universe, total density of the universe. Okay, now you might ask, that's fine. So you saw these measurements, and suppose we were presented these measurements. Would you infer all the you know nice theory that I told you about of this resonant phenomena? And our claim is even if I were to give this data points to a data analysis analyst person or a data science person and say, is there something interesting in this data? Okay, even without knowing any physics, if the person would actually uncover that the peaks are exactly equally spaced, right? So if I take these location of the peaks and plot them against each other in a completely agnostic fashion, I know no science, no physics, I just have the data. And we did this non-parametric analysis where we plotted out the relative location of the peaks. And you can see that moment you plot it out to any scientist, you would notice this regular feature. It is like a, you know, X-ray spectrum or something of a crystal, right? So you see that there is something periodic, something, uh, some phenomena of uh, resonant kind that is happening. And any physicist would kind of agree that it is out there without even worrying about knowing the physics. But of course, we know the physics and we can compute things extremely well. And then we can convert these to estimates of what are the parameters of cosmology. And we find that we know the amount of ordinary matter in the universe to 1% accuracy, the amount of cold dark matter in the universe to 2% accuracy, the Hubble expansion rate to about 1.5% accuracy. So these are numbers that are amazingly well known, just like you would expect in a mature field. So cosmologists are no longer this bunch of people who are, you know, floundering in meta science. I mean, we are as much quantitative science as any other department of physics or any other, you know, quantitative uh, area of science. So that is the amazing transition I have myself witnessed because when I started cosmology, the Hubble parameter was known within a factor of two. Okay and uh, people fought uh, a lot over where it was. And now we have it measured to 1.3% accuracy. And we actually are constrained to ex ac accept that the universe uh, in its simplest uh, model form is actually a spatially flat hypersurface, uh, which is expanding in time. The matter density is not are we, we are insignificant in the matter by, uh, energy density of the universe. The dominant, dominant energy density or what drives the dynamics of the universe is a cosmological constant, uh, something that Einstein postulated uh, could be possible in Einstein gravity. We see that the non-zero value of cosmological constant. We also see that there's a form of matter which is, uh, dark so it doesn't interact with electromagnetism like baryons do uh, but nevertheless gravitates and lambda part if you think of it like some matter it's a matter that does not cluster so it's kind of uh, repulsive matter under gravity and this is a fantastic kind uh, of fairy tale story right so this is a model uh, only a very bold person would say okay let's you know, observations are telling us that this is, must be what it is. And this is what Jim Peebles did in the early 80s. He said that what seems to be working is a model of cold dark matter. And then in 90s, he also postulated that there would be a cosmological constant. And that would be a better fit to the data. And he himself, as he says, he was very uneasy that people were accepting this so-called, you know, uh, fairy tale story so seriously. But it's amazing that all observations that I'm showing you here 
seems to suggest that this model fits all the observations that we have in cosmology extremely well. Okay, and he himself says, I'm still startled uh, after his uh, Nobel Prize, that, you know, such a model which was just built from, uh, you know, human intellect of oh, what must be there to explain the observations turns out to be the final explanation at this point. And what is it? What is amazing is, as I told you again, that the universe is simple. It's an expanding space, uh, space expanding in time. And then once you have wrapped your head around all the consequences of the expansion, it's very straightforward to use physics that we know in this context. And people have used it in all contexts possible, right? All the physics that we know of from plasma physics to high energy physics to everything has been used in the context of uh, an expanding universe and applied to cosmology. And this story that I told you with the micro background has revealed for us that we have a simple universe, yet it's very exotic. So it's not as if we don't have puzzles. We have more puzzles than we started with. We have a universe where 95% of the energy of the universe is in some form that we don't understand yet. Uh, it could be something like the cosmological constant, that's the dominant thing, which is some a fundamental constant and why it should be non-zero would be a big uh, debate among theorists. Or it could be some kind of vacuum energy, but then why would such an amount of vacuum energy be there is again a big theoretical conundrum. But it is dark, it doesn't interact with light and it's smooth form of energy which acts repulsively under gravity. And then we have cold dark matter. We cannot see it directly, but we do feel its gravitational effect. And as I'll show you, that we have you know, absolutely solid evidence of this cold dark matter uh, being there on cosmological scales. And finally, the most uh, exciting thing uh, for physics is that we know that we don't understand all of physics because there is some ultra high energy phenomena which generates this primordial perturbations that we used, uh, measured in the microwave background and used to understand cosmology. And we don't yet understand which form of high energy physics uh, phenomena uh, exactly was responsible for this. So there's something to discover. And that will tell us what kind of ultra high energy physics operated in the early universe. It could be fundamental, it could be uh, not fundamental, but uh, it is definitely out there waiting for us. Now let me, so this is where, you know, I go back to this quote from Peebles. He said he's very startled that it's working well. And why is he startled? Because he actually was, has been one of the biggest critics of his own model. But he started because many of the things that were assumed, like, you know, there's cold dark matter and there are things uh, like this acoustic phenomena. Uh, these have been independently verified, right? So I told you the acoustic phenomena already you is in a very uh, simple, uh, you know, plotting of where the peaks in the micro background lie. You could see that there is some kind of resonant phenomena because there were regular spacing in the peaks. But uh, now, with uh, something, some other aspect of the cosmic background that I didn't talk about, it also is linearly polarized. So the micro background sky has a linear polarization pattern. And if you stack up the linear polarization pattern around the hotspots, then you would find that you will see the ring that I talked about that I was uh, talking about as a resonant phenomena. So there is a way by which I can actually see that velocity, uh, that uh, ripple go out and freeze. And this is in the velocity profile. And you can see around every peak, there is a ring. Okay, and this ring, uh, you know, tells you the velocity flow and it's uh, say positive when it's blue and negative when it's red in this red area. So the radial polarization pattern is say negative and this is positive. You know, the sign doesn't matter. But the reason I'm giving it a sign is remember I stacked hot spots, which means dense parts of the plasma. Let me 
plot the same polarization patterns around the cold spots, which means decrements in the temperature. So the plasma density is smaller than uh, average. And you expect whatever phenomena happens around the density peak, uh, the velocity profile will reverse its sign along a velo uh, density minima. And that's what you see. You can go back and forth. You can see the red part has become blue, and the blue part has become red. The radial polarization pattern here and the tangential. So it's exactly the resonant phenomena. And also this ring that you see, which is the shell, which is ripple, which is moving out here between the two flows. You know, there's a positive velocity flow and negative velocity flow. And matter is piling up in this ripple out there. So do you see this acoustic phenomena exactly playing out on the micro background polarization sky? Again, there are two sets of pictures. This, these are the Planck observations. These are from observations. These are simulations. You can see the observations are as good as simulations. So these are pictures that should go into every textbook saying that, look, here's an observation which uncovers acoustic phenomena that a kid measures in the re resonance tube experiment playing out on the cosmological scale. Uh, sir, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Hmm. I think we cannot see your pointer. Uh, you can't see your point, my pointer. Uh, is I there a way to activate this? I don't know. Ah, OK. Sorry. Uh, can you see it now? Yes, sir. Ah, OK, excellent. If you told me earlier, so can I go back and tell you this again? So this is stacking up hotspots of the microwave background. OK, uh, take the uh, plant map, look at all the places where the temperature is maxima, and plot the, uh, stack the map around that. This is what you get. If you stack the polarization map around that, then you see this clear ring pattern, right? There's a ring of polarization pattern, which is tangential, and a part that is radial, right? This is, say, uh, velocity inward, and this is velocity outward. So along a density peak, you will have velocity going out and velocity coming in and to form a ripple in the density at this scale, right? You can follow my pointer. Now, the interesting part is this is around the overdense region in the plasma. Now, if I look at the cold spots of the CMB, those are the underdense regions of the plasma. And you'd expect if a particular velocity profile is given, you know, you know that velocity and density are related, right? So if I change the sign of the density, then the velocity will reverse its sign. And we see that. So if we plot the same, do the same exercise around cold spots in the microwave background, then you see wherever the uh, velocity was out outward now is inward because it's an under dense region, matter is falling into it. And there is this uh, place from where matter is moving out. So there is a uh, same effect of acoustic phenomena playing out here. Now, that is one thing that uh, observations have clearly told you that this uh, simple physics in an expanding universe which predicted for you this acoustic phenomenon in the plasma. And of course, plasma physics uh, tells you that uh, you know, is, is actually observationally verified. You see that phenomena happen. So it's not something that you are, you know, it's no longer a theoretical crutch on which your uh, assertions lie. Similarly, of course, we assumed, I told you that the small fluctuations you're seeing in the microwave background are exactly the same fluctuations involved, in, you know, which have grown into this, uh, distribution of galaxy, last case structure in the distribution of galaxies, all the voids and superclusters in the uh, galactic distribution we see. Now, how do we know it's the same small fluctuations that have grown there? So we say that's a very reasonable thing to think of, but you would like to, uh, but then it remains a paradigm till you are observationally making it completely uh, concrete. 
and this is the backbone of cosmology because this is what we use we try to connect the universe which is mildly perturbed at this early times to the present universe and the current density of matter to a dark matter baryonic matter total matter and you know cosmology constant it's not actually have to be tuned such that these two stories are consistent this fluctuation leads to this fluctuation if gravitation instability was at work and we know about how gravitation instability works so this can be all worked out theoretically but what about observationally do we know gravitation instability is at work and we have remarkable observations which show us that for example i told you about this ripple that we are seeing in the radiation but remember the baryons were also moving with the radiation into that ripple so you would expect that in the distribution of galaxies at exactly 150 megaparsecs you would see an excess of galaxies it's a very subtle effect nevertheless in 2005 observations from the sloan digital sky survey of galaxy distributions actually could resolve out this excess distribution of galaxies exactly at the scale of 150 megaparsec okay and this is a story of something called baryon acoustic oscillation somehow the radiation and its dynamics that it played out when it was totally tied up with matter has consequences in the present universe that we can measure Similarly, another window to this uh, evolve, evolution of structures is that the microwave background photons which come to us actually travel through this density perturbations and that are growing. And because gravitation, I mean, uh, uh, mass deflects uh, light, you know that uh, there's bending of light around uh, heavy mass. So there is deviation in the photon trajectory as it comes to us. And uh, so the micro background sky we're measuring is the distorted micro, micro background sky uh, distorted or lensed by this large scale structure, gravitationally lensed by the large scale structure. It's a very subtle effect. So if I had a remarkably dense object in the universe along the line of sight to the micro background, the micro background patterns would show a distinct pattern of this kind. This is very similar to what you see in the black hole uh, kind of uh, screensaver, right? This is how a very dense object distorts the vision uh, view behind it, okay? And then we also have polarization pattern, but of course the density perturbations are not this dense. These are very simple density perturbations. And the effect we are looking for is shown by these two things. So you can see I'm showing you a lensed CMB map compared to its unlensed version. This is what we have seen in the absence of large scale structure and in the presence of large scale structure. And you can see it's a very subtle change in this micro background pattern. But Planck was sensitive enough and had resolution good enough to even see this distortion and measured this distortion and made an inference for the integrated lensing mass from here to the 43 uh, you know super max theater 43 billion light years away. all the intervening matter uh, along that line of sight is mapped and you can see that there is clearly matter distributed in homogeneity just like galaxies and this matter we don't see in light so we don't see a distribution like this in light and so that is cold dark matter now the last part is uh, the story about what really created these perturbations because we seem to be making remarkable inferences about our universe from the fluctuation in the micro background. And uh, that is a big question. So we have made a huge leap in cosmology by connecting this mildly perturbed universe in the radiation that we measured in the cosmic micro background to the uh, perturbed universe or the inhomogeneous universe that we see in galaxy distribution. And uh, we have verified that gravitational instability is at work, and hence it's a robust way we can uncover what kind of cosmological model gives you a consistent picture. But we need to answer the question, 
where did these perturbations come from? And they come definitely from the very early universe. And our best understanding of that is in the very early universe, there was something called an inflation epoch where space expanded very, very rapidly in accelerated fashion. Space expanded by uh, 30 orders of magnitude in a time click of few uh, 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So in, you know, maybe 10 to the minus 34 seconds or 33 seconds, the space expanded by uh, 30 orders of magnitude, spatial distances, the universe expanded hugely. And in such a rapid stretching of space time, if you do quantum physics, quantum field theory in such a background, the quantum fluctuations can be shown to freeze out and behave almost classically and could be what is we are seeing in the micro background sky. And in fact, almost every aspect of that is verified with observations except that the same phenomena which gives to this rise to this density perturbations on the plasma surface must also be accompanied by a stochastic you know random gravitational wave background from the same epoch of inflation from almost the time that the universe that we understand came into being and this is a big quest because if we measure this we managed to uncover these uh, gravitational waves from the beginning of cosmology, then that will kind of uh, complete the picture that the early universe, uh, we believe, uh, played out in the early universe of, uh, you know, this inflationary uh, cosmology. Uh, we haven't been successful, uh, but there are upper limits on the ratio of amount of gravitational waves uh, to the amount of density perturbations we have that we quantify by something called R. And it is, it has an upper bound on it. The day we measured R, we would also know the energy scale at which inflation happened. And it's a to do or a must do for cosmology. And it's a uh, exciting thing that in India, the cosmology community came together to make a proposal to ISRO to launch a satellite for making uh, the best possible measurements you can do of the cosmic microwave background uh, sky and particularly the polarization of the microwave background to unprecedented sensitivity and accuracy and angular resolution. And this has the ultimate scientific promise of revealing quantum gravity because it may measure gravitational waves from early universe which are of quantum origin. But in the attempt to do so or doing so, it would also be guaranteed to give you a huge uh, boost in our understanding of neutral physics. It will map out all the dark matter. I showed you the map of dark matter that Planck produced, but that is a pretty low resolution, low uh, fidelity map. But uh, this is going to be really absolutely high fidelity maps of dark matter distribution in the universe and all the baryonic matter in the universe. And of course, with uh, it will improve the understanding of cosmological model by huge, huge amount, and also produce huge amount of extra galactic astrophysics uh, data sets. And in any such things where you're, you know, stretching beyond what is possible now, there's always unexpected discovery space. So typically what is required to do this is a satellite, which is fairly uh, elaborate, like the Planck was, about 4.5 meters in diameter, 4 meter in height, with a you know, system of mirrors that focuses onto a very sensitive uh, plane of detectors. And uh, this needs to be launched to a very uh, cold and stable uh, location, which is the second Lagrange point. Uh, the Sun Earth system, second Lagrange point is somewhere here, away from the Sun. And this spacecraft points away from the sun and keeps measuring the micro background. To, to make this happen, you need the best launch capabilities we have, but a satellite of this kind can be launched on GSLV Mark III, as we pointed out in our proposal. So Planck actually brought out this whole story, which was rewarded with a, uh, a Nobel Prize to Jim Peebles in 2019. Uh, it 
sort of, uh, you know, kind of gave you uh, or kind of signed off on a standard model of cosmology that has emerged from our measurements. I am very hopeful that in the next uh, decade, uh, we, we in India or in some way in the world, we or together, we would launch the next generation CMB mission uh, that would basically uh, look for these final, uh, you know, uh, little pieces that we need to complete uh, our understanding of cosmology. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for this extremely fascinating talk. And it was such an inspiring talk because we can see the uh, future staring at us of cosmology and it's an exciting future ahead, hopefully. So uh, now I will uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll just read out uh, the questions and people, if you want to unmute, you can also unmute and ask. So I'll start at the beginning. Mm. Oh, uh, lots of, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, should, I, should I start with the beginning or? Uh, okay. Oh yeah, we can start with the beginning. So, okay, so uh, I, I think somebody has raised their hand. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Okay. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, yes. Hear you, yes, here we go. I have a question about uh, the CMB Barat mission. All the pre, all the previous uh, missions like Pl Planck, Kobe, use only one channel uh, and uh, data processing were online. Is it possible to, um, in future, to measure uh, the CMB background by two counter and make comparison between two channels like in einstein podolsky rosen experiment uh, by, by comparing on uh, a quantum device. Uh, if you're asking how many uh, channel frequency channels? Um, um, uh, ch ch channels so for Planck frequency? had about nine frequency channels. Yes, but all nine frequency ch uh, channels, if I properly understand, work offline. So you write data and when you analyze. In quantum physics, in, in yeah, Stein, offline, yeah. Yeah. Oh, So you're asking whether Oh, no, so that's a technical question. We're asking whether on board we can do the differencing in frequency? Uh, comp comp comparison. Do, do you know what is einstein podolsky rosen experiment? Yes, so... Uh, two photons you can compare by the um, uh, comparing device. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, here, uh, that is not the idea. Here it's... Uh, you're essentially bolometers, so you are measuring the intensity of light. You are not uh, retaining any of its. Uh, so modes. absolutely the same as in Kobe experiment in Kobe mission. Uh, Kobe, yeah, similar idea, but with more sensitive detectors. Oh. I see, but similar. But I think in the future it will be better to do something new, essentially new. On the ground, we can do it. On board, it's exp yeah. expensive, of course. Yeah. Okay, understand. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you. And thank it's you. it's not going to reveal anything right away for cosmology. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have okay. time, we can thank discuss you. it on your mail. Well. Uh, thank, thank, thank you. Okay, so there seem to be a lot of question about 43 billion years of conformal time, not cosmic time. Ah, so Koshik Day has been attending my lectures, uh, cosmology introductory lectures. So. I think Koshik, they can explain to people what's happening here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so th I think all the questions are... Uh, you just read out which are the questions apart from that. Okay, so uh, there was, I think, one interesting question. Uh, so um, Mikhail's question... Hmm. Okay, sir, go ahead. No, so uh, if I look at the last question, it's do thermal or quantum fluctuations of the metric. So it's the quantum fluctuations of the metric that uh, contribute to observe thermal density perturbations. 
Okay, that's the answer. And then apart from being flat, how do you know the universe is expanding with some acceleration? Uh, it's not because the universe is flat that it is expanding with some acceleration. Uh, there are two ways you can uh, uh, infer that it is expanding with some acceleration. That is, one is that we know that the universe is uh, geometrically flat, uh, spatially flat. And we know that the matter density, clustering matter density is not more than 30%. But if it's flat, then the universe is exactly uh, this, the, at a critical density. Uh, so someone has to explain what is the 70% that does not cluster, yet, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, the, because the universe is flat, there must be 70% of matter which does not cluster. And it also happens to be the case that matter that does not cluster in gravity, uh, if, if that's the dominant matter, then the space actually expands in an accelerated fashion. These two facts are linked. Okay, CMB is traveling in all directions. Can't it interfere? But you should imagine that these are basically photons at uh, millimeter wavelengths, right? So they are traveling in every direction. That's perfect. But you know, the, essentially, there is no coherent thing where you can see them interfering. I mean, they would interfere, they will superpose that that's uh, part of anything of uh, light, but uh, there's no in interference p pattern that you can see. OK, and rest of the questions are related to this amount of distance photon has traveled from this Super IMAX theater screen. And that is 43 billion light years in 14 billion years. And a lot of people ask, how can, is that possible? You should have traveled only 14 billion light years. But that is not possible because the early universe was smaller. So photon actually travels more physical distance more of the physical, what constitute, contrib, uh, constitutes more physical distance now. It travels a lot more of that in the early universe. So in, in an expanding universe, it would always be the case that you would, uh, um, you know, seem to have traveled a lot more than you actually did. Ani uh, has a question. He asked, is the CMB Bharat an accepted proposal? And what's the expected launch year? No, it's not an accepted proposal. It's under consideration. Uh, but it is supposed, uh, it was also supposed to be in collaboration with uh, other space agencies. So this is, uh, at this time, ESA is looking at a mission uh, in the 2035 uh, past that time scale. Uh, so these are all, you know, under discussions, but uh, there's nothing. Uh, uh, form at this point. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, if not, I have a question. So, could you please go go to one of the slides where you showed the uh, the polarizations uh, the the two figures. Oh, am I still uh, yes, on the yes, slides? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. This, uh, so uh, on uh, on the left hand side, uh, you can see that in the very center, uh, the it's the highest uh, color, but mm. uh, on the plots which are on the right hand side. Uh, the highest uh, peak, the peak occurs uh, slightly away from the uh, center. So I could not understand that. Which one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, if you compare the plots on the left and the right, maybe I'm missing something very obvious, but uh, uh, so the uh, on the plot on the left, uh, the a highest uh, the color which has the highest yeah value. it's here yeah it's at the center here but uh, on the plot on the right hand side uh, it's around the uh, it's in a ring 
but at the same time ring, but this is uh, the showing the polarization pattern so yeah. the it's around the thing this is the velocity so the velocity at the peak is not uh, large right it's actually velocity will be out of phase with uh, density exactly 90 degrees out of phase oh okay 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 yeah. thanks thanks i'm just that Uh, so uh, one more thing I wanted to ask was maybe it's not very relevant to the talk, but uh, so you you said that we have measured the Hubble constant with uh, like high degree of accuracy, but uh, this is using the uh, using one method, right? But there are other methods also of measuring Planck constant. Uh, oh, sorry, Hubble's constant. Uh, for example, the uh, using supernovae data and standard candle method. Yes, and yes, those yes. values are also pretty accurate, uh, pretty precise. And but but they, uh, the central value which they uh, uh, get is uh, like different from the one obtained using uh, CMD. So uh, yes, yes. So that is that is uh, so called uh, inconsistency. Uh, the Hubble parameter measured from supernovae is the expansion rate close to us. Whereas Plum gives you a global expansion rate based on this standard model, right? So you have to understand the two ways they are measured are different, and the fact that they give different uh, measurements is something of concern. Uh, the cosmology community is looking at it. In fact, even a few days back, I was at a meeting where uh, there were discussions on what exactly is happening. Uh, so it could be that we are still missing, and this could be some indicating that our cosmological model is not complete. Maybe we are missing some matter density, or some you know interesting phenomena like uh, you know neutrinos had some uh, you know there are various ways you can uh, try and explain this difference. But before we really spend a lot of energy in it, we have to make sure that there are no systematic effects in the measurements. Planck has checked its data very thoroughly, and it's consistent with even more recent uh, measurements by the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Uh, and I think broadly everyone agrees that the Planck uh, value is what it is, given the model that we are considering. So either the model itself requires a change, the theoretical background model, so some physics has to happen which uh, is not part of our regular physics beyond the standard model. Okay. Uh, else, the other possibility is the measurements from the supernova are either underestimating the error bars or there is a systematic effect they have overlooked. And there is a chance of that because there is another recent measurement by uh, the same group, I mean, actually led by Wendy Friedman, who led the first cosmology measurements uh, for using the Hubble uh, telescope. Uh, she, they use something called the tip of the rape giant, okay, as a distance measure. So this measurement of the Hubble constant from supernova and all uses a cosmic ladder. So you keep calibrating, the, uh, you know, you need to measure distance as well as the redshift. And to measure distance, uh, it gets more and more difficult as you go out. So you have uh, one kind of measurements going up to some distance, and then you calibrate the second kind of measurement using that go a little further out and then finally use the supernovae. But in this whole thing, there's a chance that there could be some systematic effect. And the TRG results actually sit quite comfortably in between Planck and uh, these supernova measurements. And it's consistent with uh, Planck as well as uh, you know the, within error bars it's also consistent with that so it seems to indicate that different methods do give you different results for the local universe so we have to wait and see if this results it yeah so. go ahead uh, so if we want to report the value of Hubble's constant today what do we do do we take a mean of the two or do we report two separate values uh, two separate values, two separate values, because these are discordant values. These are not as if you can average, you take the average. Okay. And I think it's not, there's no sense in the, Sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's, go ahead. 
Ah, so so Neve has asked a question relevant to this. So, uh, what about the Hubble constant from gravitational wave detection, and does that agree with one of those methods? Ah, so uh, the error part is so large that it agrees with both of them at this point. The error bias is huge in what is in from gravitational waves, so it cannot distinguish. But future gravitational wave measurements will be able to provide an independent measurement. That will be very interesting. So there's a question by Abhinav. Uh, he asks in the plot showing the power spectrum uh, and the different peaks. Why are error bars large for small values of L, and they decrease as L increases? And this is a question of yeah, I have so, had, so if you could elaborate. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So the error bars are large because on large scales. Uh, we have a sphere so this is basically something called sample variance the number of measurements that you can take of large modes on a finite surface uh, like as that of a sphere is limited okay so what we are measuring is a difference in temperature between uh, at two different points on the sky now number of points which are separated by 180 degrees or say even 90 degrees is far less than the number of pairs of point i have which are measured uh, which are dif which differ by 1 degree the pairs are lot more and hence the number of me independent measurements we have is large and the errors are smaller whereas this one and this is something called cosmic variance if you want a name for it uh, it's called cosmic because since we are on a sphere this cannot be improved even in principle but it is something that you may be familiar with from experiments which is called sample variance if you don't have enough measurements your errors are large but in cosmology you cannot have more than a finite number of measurements at uh, large scales this is always an inherent uh, problem we will have in cosmology so one last question from my side uh, sorry for like hogging all the Time on mic. Uh, so, uh, we uh, how do we measure or how do we experimentally confirm the value of uh, the cosmological constant? And uh, like I I have, I'm not very sure, but I have heard that it's it's very very small. So, how do we know that uh, that it's actually a positive value and not uh, like it's not zero? How, how can we know if it's? Oh, no, no. So we know that it's a non-zero positive value because although the value in certain units is very small, okay, in terms of Planck units, of course, it's a very tiny number, and people point to that and say, "Oh, how can you have such a tiny number, right? Ten to a minus sixty, and you know that's a that's small, but that is enough to dominate the entire energy budget of the universe, right? So it's not small." it's a significant uh, cosmological energy density and of course if you compare anything with a uh, you know different yardstick it can look small so it i don't think there's any question that there is uh, we can we can distinguish it from zero at very high significance in fact even modeled independently so i had a paper with uh, one of my former students uh, where we showed that our uh, five sigma we can now rule out the possibility that the universe does not have cosmological constant okay but um, uh, the value when people say it's small they are talking of it as vacuum energy and in that sense yes compared to what you expect vacuum energy could have been at any characteristic uh, uh, energy scale uh, this is really really tiny you know where your you know all your physics happens you know the physics that we could imagine giving rise to phase transitions at the level of you know hundreds of tv uh, would correspond to a cosmological constant many many orders of magnitude larger than what we measure the cosmological constant we measure is kind of in the ev scales and so how do we my first part of the question was how do we uh, experimentally determine the cosmological constant So we discovered because we know that there are two ways. One is we know that the universe is flat, and thirty percent of it is only uh, only matter that clusters is only thirty percent of it. If the rest has to matter, that does not cluster, and a cosmological constant fits that bill. And if you take that energy density, this is what the energy density is. 
So that's one measurement. Even the accelerated universe gives you a measurement of how much of that density. But it's the cosmogic, uh, you know, it's 70% of the critical density of the universe now uh, is the cosmological constant. That's how we measure it. Okay, thank you for uh, patiently ask, answering all the questions. If anybody else has uh, any questions, please speak up now. Or type in the chat box. Yeah. yeah. Or you can meet me anytime in my office sometime. Just maybe email me and fix up a time to talk. Oh, I think we missed a question by Abhinav. So he is asking, uh, how does uh, first peak in that plot I think he's referring to the uh, okay, the CL plot. Okay, uh, so how does it show? That's because uh, it's interesting. It's very simple geometry. That I have I have a hundred and fifty megaparsec ruler. So I mean that I can measure, which is placed forty three billion light years away. Okay, now I know then all the three uh, uh, sides of a triangle. I know that two direction. Uh, you know. Uh, lines of sight going 43 light years, uh, billion light years and the 150 million parsecs. Okay, that triangle, what the angle it subtends at me in a flat universe, I know. And when I'm showing you the CMB uh, power spectrum, it's inverse L that I'm talking about is actually inverse angular scale. Okay, and the peak happening at that scale means that is the peak that is the angle subtended by 150 megaparsec placed 43 billion light years away. Okay, so that angle we know what it would be by Euclidean geometry. If it was non Euclidean, I mean, if it was not what we measure it to be, then we would have invoked non Euclidean geometry in the sense that the universe is not flat, especially flat, and explained uh, what uh, if the angle really was not uh, exactly. Uh, what was predicted in Euclidean geometry, it would have been non-Euclidean geometry. So it would have been a spherical universe or a hyperbolic universe, not a flat Euclidean universe. If there are no okay, I think we're done. Uh, so if there, if there are no further questions, I would like to uh, thank Professor Saurabh for uh, giving some of his time to our Astro Week event, and it couldn't have begun any in, in in any better way. So thank you so much for giving such a fantastic talk, and uh, we hope to have thank more you, thank you for attending it. Sure. Okay. Thank you, and I'll thank end you. the meeting now. Good evening, sir. Okay. Good evening.